much uh, uh, in joy and pleasure to meet you after such a long time. I've met you personally. So I'm really honored. And uh, this is Vishnu Kumar. <laughs> he is like my brother. And we both have been very much looking forward to this opportunity for a few years. We have spoke, we have been speaking about it, but 2002 happened to be the time you have granted us this uh, opportunity. So first of all, we really like to thank you for taking time to come for this interview. Thank you so much. So before we start, we would like to uh, just offer our prayers, gratitude with the Guru Mantra chanting just to you know offer our prayers to the siddhas and your great work and contribution for this art guru brahma guru vishnu guru devo maheshwaraha guru sakshat para brahma tasmai shri gurave namaha arut peranjodi tani perum garunai Tani Perum Garunai Arut Perun Jodi. So Guruji, we would like to, you know, some of some of the questions are given to me by uh, from some of the students who have been uh, learning from us. Some of the questions is both Vishnu Kumar and I would like to ask you and just get your point of view. Uh, as we are all as we are in this path so if you can share with us how did you become initiated into this kriya yoga tradition and just briefly describe your journey the first initial days of your journey to this tradition there's always a preparation so i was a seeker after spiritual truth while at university many existential questions and uh, this was at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. at my junior year abroad in 1968 at the University of Fribourg in Switzerland. After a year in Europe and Switzerland, I returned in 1968. And I immediately, by chance, discovered the autobiography of a yogi at my parents' home in Los Angeles. And I was uh, very much uh, impressed by the book. It answered so many of my questions. And fortunately, I lived close to Paramahansa Yogananda's Lake Shrine in Malibu. So I went there and I was impressed with the place and I decided to apply to become a member of their monastery. I was told that I had to wait for one year, practice what I had learned in their lessons, and then I would be accepted. A few months later, when I was in my final year at Georgetown University, practicing what I had learned, I saw a notice in a small anti-war free newspaper, Kriya Yoga classes, phone number. So I went there to a small apartment nearby and I found there was two disciples of Yogi Ramaya who were giving some weekly classes. And he was coming down once a month on the Greyhound bus to give a lecture and a, and a more extensive class. I was very impressed with him. And uh, after a few months, I decided that I would prefer to take initiation from a living guru rather than from an organization. And um, so at that time, I also, so I took the initiation from him in June of 1970 in uh, lower Manhattan, New York City. And uh, I was so impressed with the training that I asked to join his planned ashram in Los Angeles which was my parents' home. And um, so I drove across country two, two, three months later after fulfilling a probationary period. And um, I lived with him in his, this center and others for the next 18 years. During the first year with him in Los Angeles, he taught me the second and third initiations. Then he sent me to Chicago to start a center and also to prepare for a one-year assignment to live in his ashrams in Mailapur, Adras, and also at his ancestral home where he had established an ashram in Kanadikutan, Tawal Nadu. And um, this I did from 1972 to 1973. 
practicing what I had learned intensively. During the next 18 years, I practiced yoga eight hours a day, worked eight hours a day in a variety of jobs, in a variety of cities where he sent me. And the rest of the time was mine to take rest or prepare food or to take care of the work of daily life. So it was a very intense practice in all mm -hmm. these years. Great. Thank you so much. It, it is very inspirational to hear your initial journey into this path. And uh, hopefully our students will also gain some insights from this initiation to this path. So could you please share any memorable experience that you had with any great masters when you have visited India or any encounters with great masters? Yes, I'd like to share one. In 1975, with Yogi Ramaya and three other of his disciples, we drove from Los Angeles to a vegetarian congress in Orno, Maine, 3,000 miles away. And we stopped in the Rocky Mountains in a place called Pikes Peak. And uh, we camped. The Yogi Ramaya told us he was going to walk into the forest for a while and stay there. And no one should follow him. But I was curious because I'd never heard him say something like that. So I followed discreetly and um, I hid behind a tree as I watched him sit down under a tree. And uh, I noticed his eyes going up, turning upwards, he became very still. And then the uh, light started to form around his body and it became more and more intense. And finally, it was so intense I couldn't even see his body anymore, just a huge ball of light like the sun. This went on for about 20 minutes and I was rubbing my eyes and pinching my skin to make sure I wasn't hallucinating or dreaming. And then after about 20 minutes, he's, I, the light started to dim and uh, I started to see his form again. He got up and started walking back to our camp. He noticed me hiding behind the, the tree and he simply said, I told, I said, no, no one should follow me. Later, I asked him, what was he doing? And he simply said, I am planting seeds. Right, right, yes. So he meant Next in a question. very, yes, fantastic. <laughs> the, that's one word is a very deep meaning, what he said, planting seeds, yes. Yeah, he used to give long lectures. Usually they would be very late at night and many people would fall asleep listening to them. And he would usually make a comment afterwards saying, doesn't matter, uh, the seeds which I have planted were, are registered in their subconscious mind and they will sprout in, in either this birth or the next birth. Yes, great, great. Please tell us about the Siddhas, especially you have, I have read the books and you have, uh, you know, shared a lot of, uh, you know, uh, like comparison between Siddhas, Patanjali and Thirumular's teachings, but particularly Sage Thirumular and his Thirumandram. You have highlighted in some of the interviews, the recent interviews you sent me, you did highlight about the Siddha Thirumular and uh, we would like to hear anything very recent that uh, about Thirumular, Thirumandaram, or the work you have been doing in that Thirumular sage. Okay, well, Thirumular was a fully realized master of what we call Kundalini Yoga today. He had been initiated by a sadhu named Nandi from North India, whose spiritualization was so great that he identified with Shiva himself. Thirumular's practices included the whole breadth of what we call today Tantra, which is, of course, the tradition which links the material world with the spiritual world. Huge body of literature in India, Tibet, and China. Okay. The key word in Tantra, of course, is transformation. The goal was not to go to some heaven or to be liberated from the cycle of birth. The goal is to transform our human nature. And this is done by surrender of the egoistic perspective to the perspective of our soul, of the witness. 
of pure consciousness. Tirumalar is the author of Tirumandaram, which is uh, written in 3,000 verses. I first published this English translation of it in 1993. It was first translated by Dr. B. Natarajan, who I met with Yogi Ramai in 1982 as he was completing it. He couldn't get, he, he had a disagreement with the original sponsors of the publication. So the book was never published for 10 years until I made an effort to bring it out. And I brought it out in three volumes with very little commentary, just some introductory chapters, and many, uh, illustrations. It was my dream to bring this book out with commentary and a much more accurate translation. And this is what I did with the help of a team of scholars. I founded a research project in 2000. And uh, this team of six scholars went through a whole series of palm leaf manuscripts. They searched all over South India. I'm showing you here what a palm leaf manuscript looks like. You can see that the text is scratched on a yes. palm leaves. leaf. Yes. Palm leaf, right? And this palm leaf is about three hundred years old and it's a copy of another palm leaf which, which was 300 years old which is a copy of another palm leaf which was at least 300 years old okay these things last much more than paper or diskettes or cds right this is the original tech cycle as we say right yes and so we found over a thousand of these and we translated some of them into modern tamil and then some of them even into english and one of the works that we have published is the Tiramandra. And uh, we published it in 3,800 pages, 3,000 verses with commentary. This is that publication. Yes. This is and a great work. I had a chance to get one copy from you when I visited you five years ago. So, yes. yes. So, this is a huge it, almost encyclopedia of Tantra, Yoga, Mantra, Yantra, spiritual alchemy and wisdom. It's a seminal work, not only because he refers to it as a new yoga, but because it is the one literary work in the Tamil language which discusses yoga. Also because the word Saiva Siddhanta, the name of the predominant religion of South India, appears for the first time in it. There's also one of the 12 literary works in the Shaiva canon or Bible of South India. It contains a verse, number 115, which depending on how you interpret it, gives rise to two schools of philosophy. One that is dualist or what theologians would call pluralist, the belief that there is a God, the world, and the soul, but that they are eternally separate. And this is the basis of what's called Saiva Siddhanta and the basis of temple worship in South India. The other, which is the other school, which is much less well known, is the yogic school, which theologians would refer to as monistic theism. Monism is the belief that there's only one, one reality, Brahma. And theism is the belief that there are three, God, the soul, and the world. So it sounds like a contradiction. So I'll give you an analogy to help you understand. At the beginning of your path, God is something or someone very distant, unknowable. It's like looking at a mountain far away from you. At some point, you might meet someone who has been to the mountain and you become friends with him. This is the first stage. This friend at some point may bring you to a path up the mountain, and there are many paths. 
This brings you to the second stage. First stage is referred to in Cyber Siddhartha as Charya. The second phase is referred to as Kriya. And Kriya means action with awareness. And it includes ritual practices, visualization inside and also externally. As you come up, go up the mountain, you start to develop the qualities of the mountain. You begin to see things from a higher perspective. This is the third stage of yoga. And you begin to manifest divine qualities. Finally, when you reach the top of the mountain, you no longer see the mountain because you are the mountain. Like a wave on the surface of the ocean, you are no longer confused as to your identity. They are not two. You and the mountain are one, just as the wave and the ocean are one. This is what we call yana, the fourth stage. So this is discussed in both Saiva Sananda and in yoga. But in the, let's say, the dualist perspective, according to how you translate this verse, it's considered to be the soul and the world and God are, are eternally separate. Whereas the, in yoga, we see them as one. That everything, all manifestation in the world is an emanation it appears out of the ocean, just like a wave, and it disappears back into the ocean. They are not eternally separate, they are eternally one. The Mahavakya is, they are not two, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so this is a very important distinction, which um, nowhere in the writings of the Siddhas, including Tiruvandram, are there any words of praise for Hindu deities or encouragement to go to the temples? The conception of God held by the Siddhas is, is impersonal, vast luminous light referred to as Vetaveil or Satchitananda, absolute being, consciousness, and bliss. The writings of the Tiramandaram and the Siddhas in general in the literature is deliberately written in such a way that only an initiate can discover the hidden meaning. This is so that the practices are not misused. And the techniques themselves are never taught except in person. They're only given general descriptions in the writings. A good introduction to the yoga of Tirumar is the book written by Dr. late Dr. Ranapati, which is called The Yoga of Tirumar. Essays mm -hmm. on the Tiramandram. And he was the director of our research project during uh, 12 years. A good introduction to the writings of the Siddhas is my book, Babaji and the 18th Siddha Kriya Yoga Tradition. And for the Westerner, the book, The Wisdom of Jesus and the Yoga Siddhas, which I wrote while, I was, while we were working on this research project together. You are very right about the Thirumolars so aphorisms are more with hidden meanings. Only the, the one who are, who are initiated in this path, who are more awareness to this path, is able to understand the hidden meaning in these poems. So I remember listening to my father's, one of these, uh, his favorite, you know, so mantra, Thirumantra, Anjanam Pondudal Ayurum Andiyo. So it talks about, Anjanam is basically a, the, the facial cover or a facial makeup, or in those days, they use it as a cover for the face. So he talks about the, 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 the density of kapha comparing to that anjana that we apply on the face. And another thing he also talks about is the pullinum mikka puraviyai merkonda, which means something that goes far, faster than a horse. He's referring to the speed of the breath during pranayama practice. So my father said, these are very, you know, uh, it may, people may just take it as it is, but during yoga practice, someone who is in the path of yoga to understand the meaning behind this mantra, as you said, is exactly true. Yes. Yeah, the, the, the language is, is poetic. Yes. Because in poetry, you can bring many concepts together in a beautiful way, unlike in prose, where you have to have a more analytical uh, presentation. Yes. And um, the commentaries that were written by the scholars 
and ourselves, myself and my wife, as well as what we have put in this book here, includes, you might say, the, um, the coded language, the explanation of the coded language. Yes. So as you become more familiar with the coded language, this also helps you. But my teacher always said the basis of his all his teachings, whenever we met with him, was to read out a verse from the from the siddhas, to have us chant it with him, memorize it, then he would give us the, the English translation, and then he would ask us to meditate on it. Mm -hmm. And whatever inspiration we got to write it down and show it to him. And then he would give us a grade. He would say, you got 10% or you got 30%, but it was rare for anybody to get more than uh, 50%. Wow. So this is the thing that we, we always studied with him was to try to meditate on the verses. Yes, yes. This is the concept I think uh, the students of today should understand. As you said, meditate on these mantras or something which, which gives you a certain set of understanding to the meaning behind it, right? So... Yeah, well, it helps you to go beyond your puny intellect, as you your like would call it, and to get in touch with the voice of your soul, yes. what Orobindo calls the psychic being, which yeah. is trying to guide you, but has a soft voice compared to your ego, which is screaming at you with all of its, all its habits and memories. Yes, exactly said right. So this question is, from me personally, if you, I mean, I don't mean to compare two great siddhas. I don't mean to see who is superior than anyone, but I just would like to get your, you know, your viewpoint on the differences or, or let's say, uh, what is the uniqueness of the teachings of Sage Patanjali and Sage Thirumula? Sure. Yeah. I have devoted um, 10 years to meditating on the Yoga Sutras. Mm -hmm. And that I could, I meditated on each one of the verses, and then I wrote a book based on those meditations, which I published 20 years ago, the Kriya Yoga Sutras of Patanjali and the Yoga Siddhas, mm -hmm. which is now published in many languages. And uh, in part one of the introductory chapter, I included a comparison table on 20 important issues um, which address which are addressed in both works of Patanjali and the Tirumandram. And this comparison demonstrates that they either had the same guru or they both came from the same Siddha lineage. Furthermore, in more than 20% of the commentaries I wrote in this book, I included quotations from the Tirumandram to show how similar were their um, positions. According to the West leading scholar, the late Dr. Georg Feuerstein, who helped me to start the Yoga Siddha Research Project, in the foreword to my book, which he wrote, the term Ashtanga Yoga was not originated by Patanjali, as it appears in earlier texts. Rather, Patanjali's yoga was Kriya Yoga, which he defined in the first verse of the Yoga Sutra's second chapter, or Pada, as three elements, tapas, intense practice, swadaya, self-study, and surrender, ishvara pranidhanava. Surrender of the egoistic perspective to the perspective of the witness soul, pure consciousness. We can say that Babaji himself, who is the founder of living, found, living fountainhead of our own tradition, created his own Kriya Yoga as a synthesis between the Siddha's writings, Tantra, and that of Patanjali, which is what we call classical yoga. Mm. Nowhere in the writings of Patanjali do we see the word Kundalini or chakras or even references to energy, okay? So if we consider absolute truth, the absolute reality as conscious energy, we refer to this in yoga as Shiva, conscious, Shakti, energy, right? Consciousness is not a thing. It's what observes 
everything. Everything is a manifestation of nature. Everything is an object, right? So Patanjali concentrated on one side of the coin. There's always, this, there's always two sides of a coin. Mm. He focused on consciousness and Tirubular focused on the other side of the coin, which is the manifestation in nature. This is because the goal of the siddhas was not simply to dissolve into consciousness like the Vedantins, like the Buddhists, but to bring higher, this higher consciousness, this divine consciousness, to manifest fully in this world progressively. We'll talk more about that later. Now, as far as a comparison on the different elements of Ashtanga Yoga, of course, Ashtanga refers to eight limbs or Angas. These include Yamas, the social restraints, Niyamas, strict observances or virtues, Asanas, which are physical postures to make the body relaxed and stable, Pranayama, breathing techniques to balance the vital energy, Pratyahara, withdrawal of our consciousness from the senses, Dharana, concentration, Dhyana, continuous awareness of a chosen object or subject, and Samadhi which is difficult to describe. So we simply refer to it as being aware of what is aware. That is cognitive absorption. Mm. Now, with regards to the first Yama, the word Yama means death, and it's referring to the Lord of death, and it refers to death of the ego, which is, of course, what creates all of our suffering, which creates all the confusion. Patanjali refers to only five yamas or social restraints. They are ahimsa, non-harming, truthfulness, satya, chastity in thought, word, and action, brahmacharya, non-stealing, and greedlessness. Tirumar mentions these five only briefly and adds more. Being charitable, humble, good, virtuous, pure, and self-controlled, avoidance of alcohol and lust. Stealing, of course, and lust, lying and addiction create inner darkness. Chastity and charity awaken unconditional love. Unlike Tirumalar, Patanjali, in subsequent verses after mentioning these, he has additional verses in which he explains the benefits of each of the Amas and the Niyamas. The Amas, of course, are the observances or virtues. Patanjali refers to, describes five of them. Purity, contentment, constant or intense practice, self-study, and surrender, or worship of the divine. Tita Mahar also mentions these, but in addition, he has 10 Niyamas, like Patanjali, they include purity, contentment, constant intense practice. But he adds some more. He says, faith in God and the soul and the sadness or disciplines to liberate oneself from the fetters of or limitations of egoism, which are, are of course, the mala. They refer to the fetters or limitations like what keeps a bull from when a bull is tied up to a rope or a chain, it's he's fettered, right? And he can't move beyond a certain range. So I asked Yogi Ravaya once, how much how much freedom do we actually have? And he said, it's like the fetter which holds the bull in place. We are limited by our ignorance of our true identity. We're limited by our karma, consequences of our past thoughts, words, and actions, and we're limited by maya, mm -hmm. which is defined as limitations, feeling of limitation in knowledge, time, power to do things, karma, and desire. As far as the niyamas, Tirumalar also mentions 
not only study, but study of the sacred literature of Siddhanta, known as the Saiva Agamas, specifically. He also mentions contemplation of their inner wisdom, which is like Swadaya, sacrifice and authorities. So it's very similar. Each of them has elaborated in their own ways. As far as comparison with regards to Asana, Patanjali mentions only two verses. In the first verse, he defines an asana as that which produces thera and sukha, stability and relaxation. In the next verse, he says, from this relaxation of tension in the body, samadhi is established, which is significant because even hatha yoga can be a means to self-realization or samadhi. He mentions no specific postures. Tiru Malar, however, mentions eight important sitting postures, and he describes how to practice five of them. Regarding P P Pranayama, Patanjali only mentions the phases of the breath. He makes no reference to Kundalini or the chakras or to Pranayama. Tiru Malar, um, while he does not refer to the word Kundalini, it is evident that he was a master of it. He describes in detail various practices of kundalini breathing, the use of mantras, yantras, mudras, and internal esoteric visualizations. So my book, The Kriya Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, contains over 350 pages of comparison between the two. You know, we could talk for weeks about this. Of course. Thank you. So basically, my question, you have written a book and to give a very detailed explanation on the teachings of Patanjali and Thirumular. And uh, definitely I would like to get one, you know, then and then recommend to our students to have this view. You know, it's very important today because most people are, most people think yoga sutras are only in Sanskrit language. They don't understand there are, uh, there is a book in Tamil language, which is the Thirumandram and Thirumular and how he details all of these, as you said about the Ashtanga Yoga in a much more deeper way, you know, when yeah. it comes to Yoga this, Sutras of Padanchali. My book is also available in the Tamil language and in Hindi. Great, right, great. Right. Good to know, good to know. So what advice would you give to the students navigating the path of yoga, especially in these troubled times, challenging times of COVID? so much technological you know development happening in you know it is bombarding people's lives so how do you think a yogi should you know approach this phase of life the first question that i the first thing i say in my introductory lectures when people come to our ashram i say why are you here mm -hmm. why are you here not just here in this ashram, but in this world. Right? And I said, it's, it's probably the most important question you need to answer in this life. Yes. I and, and I don't need to hear your answer, but I want you to reflect upon it. Right. And when you have found the answer, begin to form some intentions, make, to make some choices and form some intentions or in sankalpas. So that you can bring whatever you do in yoga, whatever you practice, whether it's meditation or yoga postures or breathing or mantras or study. So you can bring it into alignment with the choices that you're going to make. Your choices should be informed by your values. And value is a question of priority. People say, I don't have time to practice yoga, but everybody mm. has 24 hours. So it just means it's not my priority. So make it your priority. First thing you do in the morning after getting up and taking a shower or a bath, sitting, doing your practice, everything else in your day will go much better. And the objectives you have now may begin to evolve. Maybe now you're simply practicing yoga to relieve your stress, have peace of mind, improve your health, right? or even to be more physically attractive. But as you begin to realize those objectives, right? Don't be limited by them, okay? Mm. Otherwise, you're like a person who goes into the supermarket 
And once you find a bottle of milk, that's all you need, right? You're missing the whole entire supermarket of so many things that yoga has to offer you. People are so ignorant of the vast offerings of yoga. It's our greatest heritage. It's the product of 300 generations of yogis who have developed it. And uh, so if you're waiting for an inheritance from your grandmother, stop, stop thinking of that, okay? Think mm. of the inheritance that yoga siddhas have given to you. And it's good to practice a yoga which is integral. What we might say today in modern times, holistic. It includes all five bodies, physical, vital, the seat of the emotions and desires, mental, intellectual and spiritual. Okay? This way you'll be able to transform those things which are now a limitation, those things which are now causing you suffering. Thank you, thank you. Well said, Keith. So I will leave the next three questions to be addressed by Master Vishnu. <laughs> okay. Namaste Guruji. Namaste. It's been a long time. First time I met you in 2004. I don't know if you remember me. I met you for a book release of 18 Siddhas tradition. That's the big book which you released in 2005 uh, in Arla yeah. Pet in Chennai. <laughs> yes, I remember. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I have some few questions uh, which, which has been asked by, from, from our students. Like, you know, one of the students has asked us, like, what is the benefits of doing, uh, you know, Kriya Yoga? And then is there any lifestyle changes they have to make when they practice Kriya Yoga? Like any food restrictions, diet restrictions? Uh, well, uh, can, can they practice as they are, you know? So... Sure. There is no lifestyle or dietary requirements. However, mm -hmm. during the first initiation, we begin by making some recommendations mm -hmm. because how you live your life is going to affect the results of your practice, just like the practice of yoga is going to affect your life. So you can't really divorce the two. Mm -hmm. And so we recommend that people take a scientific approach mm -hmm. to whatever recommendations we have, mm -hmm. whatever techniques we teach, and a scientist is always willing to form hypotheses mm. and to test them, to record the experiences and to share with other researchers. This is exactly what we do also. Mm -hmm. So the techniques and the recommendations are the hypotheses. The laboratory is in your own home. You, you record in your notebook what experiences you have, doubts that you have, and you bring those experiences, you share with other researchers, other sadaks in regular meetings. Yeah. And like that, you can begin to form some conclusions. Babaji's Kriya Yoga is, of course, a five-fold path, five angas or, or branches. The first is what's called Kriya Hatha Yoga. And it includes 18 postures which have been selected and which are by Babaji and which are taught in a way which he has prescribed. And these are uniquely beneficial for several reasons. Unlike all other series of postures, as taught by us, all of them move kundalini energy from the lower to the higher chakras. And by, do by so doing, one's consciousness rises from the ego-based lower chakras, me, myself, and I, right? Where we're preoccupied with desires and sex and security to the chakras which are associated with the psychological states of love, creativity, intuition, and awareness of the presence of the divine. The second thing which makes them quite unique is that they have remedial effects, all of them. Yogi Ramaya was a physical therapist and a pioneer in the field of yoga therapy. And in a little blue book, Kriya Hatha Yoga, the indications, benefits, contraindications are indicated in a very succinct way. And he had a lot of good experience, both when he was studying physical therapy and in the clinic, which he ran in, in Mylapur for 10 years with handicapped people and people who had all kinds of functional disorders. 
The third thing that's unique about them is that they are practiced uh, um, with a relaxation after each posture. Unlike all other schools at yoga, you only relax at the end. And the reason is simply because during the relaxation period, your circulatory system is able to catch up and to transport the waste products which have been pushed into it mm -hmm. intensively during a particular posture from a particular part of the body into the circulatory system and carry it away to the organs of elimination. So in this way, you are helping the body to remove the source of fatigue and potential mm -hmm. toxins or ama, as they say in Ayurveda. No other school of yoga does this, yet it's been confirmed by the research done in the research institutes in India. The second anga or practice at Babaji's fivefold path is Kriya Kundalini Pranayam, which as we teach it, prepares one for a gradual awakening of what we call potential power and consciousness. That's our definition of Kundalini, potential power and consciousness. What's your potential? What limits it? We have a well that goes down 400 feet here at the ashram because we're on a mountain, right? And it'll stay there, the water, unless we have what? A pump. So the technique of Kriya Kundalini Pranayam is like the pump, which draws the energy up. And the basic principle of all the tantric traditions of Tantra is that energy follows consciousness and consciousness follows energy. Energy, yeah. <laughs> so if you draw energy up to the higher chakras, consciousness automatically goes there. Yes. This is why when you practice Kriya Kundalini Pranayam, you start to see the light within, right? You become aware of your true identity what the Siddhas refer to as vast, luminous light, Vitta Veil. One also becomes magnetic. One attracts, one draws to oneself what one is seeking. Right? First, it might be some desires, but later as one purifies oneself, particularly the subconscious, one begins to manifest the circumstances, the resources, the events which help us to manifest our dharma, our mission of life. The third anga is practice of dhyana, which we define as the scientific art of mastering the mind. We don't like the word meditation because most people think that's just making the mind go blank. If that's all it was, you just hit yourself over the head and you'd have a blank mind. If yoga was only a science, by the end of the initiation, everyone would be, would be enlightened. If they stayed awake, understood everything, and it was explained clearly. But unfortunately, we have a lot of, we have a human nature which resists, which has doubts, which has habits. So we need the art. And the art is the practice, right? And you have to do it regularly because there's a lot of limitations and things holding you back, especially in your vital body, the seat of desires and emotions. As you gradually practice the first meditation technique, Shuddhi Dhyana Kriya, you begin to might say, cleanse the subconscious mind of the memories that one is attached to, one dwells on, right? Pleasant memories, painful memories, and also habits, right? Samskaras, which together form your karma. If you made a list of the memories that you dwell on and your 10 most predominant habits, you can pretty much predict what's gonna happen to you in the coming years. So by removing them, you gradually find very, very quickly that your outer life begins to change. Your choices, your values, and even the circumstances, relationships begin to change. People were astonished uh, when they, they were expecting spiritual experiences and what they got was divorce, a new job, um, you know, major, uh, major decisions that they make in their life, which change the direction of their life and their circumstances. As one becomes purified of these samskaras and vasanas, one becomes, one develops concentration. One begins to see one's path, but the mind still wanders. So the second meditation technique, you learn how to concentrate properly. And you begin to see clearly where you want to go. Instead of being simply a dreamer, the siddhas said, we are dreaming with our eyes open. Now you begin to become a visionary. 
and you and your dreams become informed by your soul who's trying to guide you and you begin to manifest what's called your dharma or your the fourth meditation technique you learn to develop your intellect which we've been in the last 45 minutes or so it's that part of you which has reasoning which communicates which analyzes which solves problems but it can't solve all your problems right if you're trying to decide to get married to a certain person it's not your intellect which is going to help you you could do a cost benefit analysis that's really not the basis of a decision <laughs> fortunately you have higher faculties you have yeah. the intuition you have the psychic you have the super consciousness unfortunately you don't use them and in our materialistic rational culture there's no encouragement to use them there's even doubts expressed about their nature so in the fifth sixth and seventh meditation techniques you'll learn to develop the intuition the psychic being the voice of your soul and the super consciousness the fifth anga the fourth anga is called kriya mantra yoga the transmission of sound vehicles of higher consciousness mm -hmm. by one who is in such a state of higher consciousness to one who has purified himself suitably these awaken the chakras and enable one to develop particular virtues associated uniquely with each mantra they purify the mind of negative thinking they help to develop the intellect by creating a space in which inspiration can come and replace some of the habitual thinking the fifth anga is kriya bhakti yoga the cultivation of love and devotion and aspiration aspiration is a key word it's the opposite of desire desire is the belief of your ego that it can find happiness in things that don't last and it's driven by impulses in the vital body emotions it's looking constantly for little delights through new experiences right mm -hmm. it has no in there's there's no real how should i say wisdom in it in these choices right we just do it for fun so to speak right and we have to make mistakes as a result but the negative often it's just a desire that which we, which we try so in aspiration, this is the voice, this is the call of your soul to escape from all the suffering, the limitations which are created by egoism, the perspective of I'm the body, I'm the mind, I'm all my doubts, I'm all my emotions, the realization that this is really a prison and I don't want to be in this prison anymore. I want to experience unconditional love pure truth beauty wisdom so you begin to seek begin to seek and you mm -hmm. begin to search and at mm -hmm. some and you begin to have as a result of your call as a result of your aspiration you begin to have some glimpses of something beyond something which is greater something which is truer something which is deeper and this is so fulfilling that you keep going you want this more and more and more so you it's like a little flame and you start adding fuel to it and it begins to burn up the veils which now hide you which now hide the truth and the light right so bhakti yoga helps you to cultivate this aspiration this is what we call surrender of the perspective of the ego to the perspective of who you truly are which is has no form it's not limited in time or space it was never born it never dies it's always here, everywhere you go. It's the one constant from the beginning moments of your life to the end of your life. It's simply watching, saying, wow, look at that. Look at this foolish fellow. Look at all these mistakes he's making, right? Absolutely. How long does it take for these benefits to manifest? One could expect the benefits to manifest in the following time frames. If you practice the 18 postures, at least 30 minutes a day, five times a week, after a week or two, you'll start to have more energy, better sleep, decreased symptoms of chronic health problems. If you practice the pranayama twice a day as prescribed, 
within a month, you're going to feel more mental clarity, more energy, growing awareness of the inner divine self. If you practice meditation, as we prescribe on a regular basis, at least 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening, you'll, within three to six months, notice you have increased self-control, significant changes in your relationships, your values, your outer circumstances, and you'll let go of habitual and limiting tendencies, habits, attachments, aversions, and you begin to see and manifest your dharma, your mission in life. And people who are close to you will probably notice how much you've changed even before you notice. Thank you, Guruji. It was uh, such a nice answer. And uh, one, one of the important things you have told is about the Bhakti Yoga. Bhakti Yoga can remove the obstacles for meditation and then practice, isn't it? So Bhakti Yoga and then uh, devotion towards uh, devotion towards uh, yoga practice, especially Kriya Yoga practice, is yeah, very, very essential to remove the obstacles in uh, yeah, meditation. Probably two main reasons is because Bhakti rides the horse of the vehicle of emotion emotions and most of our most of our emotions are negative right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely fear, Especially boredom, in Hong Kong, yeah. <laughs> sadness, depression, anger fear and the positive emotions are what courage acceptance courage. love yeah. peace right so the vital body is the seat of the emotions and they have a tremendous influence they basically on the mind, you know, most of our mind is simply reacting to whatever we're feeling emotionally. Right? Mm. The other thing, of course, is that the Siddha's definition for God, the Siddha said, Anbushivam, love is God. Oh, yeah. Many saints and many traditions have said God is love, but only the Siddha reversed it and said, Anbushivam. So even if you don't believe in God or a supreme being, but you believe in love and the power of love, you begin to do things in a loving way and immediately you feel wonderful, right? Yes, because yes, it's definitely. your soul. Your soul is in a state of unconditional joy 24 hours a day. Joy is not the same, or bliss is not the same as happiness. Happiness is always conditional. Does the, do I like the food or do I not like the food? Is it too cold or too hot? Am I getting what I want or getting what I don't want? It's always conditional. Whereas your soul doesn't care 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it's in a state of bliss. It's in a state of unconditional joy, right? And that's the key word that he has, you said, bliss. Happiness is you have choices to make, whereas bliss is unconditional. You know, everything is pure joy, you know, yes. Yeah, it's really a matter of just calming and quieting the vital body. The more that the vital body's demands, its desires, its emotions become quiet, the more the light of your soul and the joy of your soul becomes apparent. Mm, it's an inverse relationship. That's why we talk so much about purification. Yes, yes. And Guruji, I would like to ask you some questions regarding the stages of uh, Kriya Yoga, Kriya Yoga tradition. And then, uh, so how can uh, you know uh, the student or a teacher can follow the stages of Kriya Yoga path. We offer the training in, in Babaji's Kriya Yoga first with, uh, you might say, um, Kriya Hatha Yoga. Hatha Yoga. Mm -hmm. And um, my teacher always insisted that one practice the 18 postures before coming for initiation. Mm -hmm. And we offer this um, whenever there's a, a a, a student who's familiar with the post, 18 postures, they can teach it. We also have a, a training program for people who want to learn how to teach it very correctly. We also offer it through uh, the little blue book, which I mentioned, Kriya Hatha Yoga, which uh, is a free download on our, the Chinese page, homepage of our website. Oh. You'll see that you can download it in Chinese. Right? Okay. And uh, you can also order copies in many other languages. We also have it in a two hour video, instructional video, mm. professionally done. Um, and it is now being done in Chinese by um, mm. Anjani. Mm. So 
once one decides one wants to come for initiation, we recommend that there be some preparation. I'll talk more about that. The first initiation can be done whenever there's a teacher present. We call these teachers acharyas, and only the, one can, we offer this, the only way you can receive the first initiation is in person with uh, someone who's been trained to present it according to our standard. And uh, after receiving the first initiation, you're eligible to, to attend the second initiation, but you have to wait a year to receive the third initiation from the time you received the first initiation. We offer also a Kriya Hatha Yoga teacher training program, uh, which is at the 300 hour uh, level of Yoga Alliance. To those who have attended the first and the second initiation, or those who have attended only the first initiation but have significant relevant experience in Hatha Yoga. We offer membership in the order of Acharyas, the lay order of teachers, only on an invitation basis to those who've completed uh, the above initiations to create the yoga teacher training. And they are trained in, in, uh, in, in person right, regularly. I'd like to add that we do not allow money to be an obstacle to receive initiation. Um, my teacher used to say the only currency of any value in the field of yoga is sincerity. Yeah. And sincerity means doing what you say you're going to do. Right. So Absolutely. when we send people the enrollment form, we ask them to make a commitment. We say, are you willing to practice these techniques regularly? And people have to sign it. Unless we, if they don't, we don't accept them. So this is like their son call, their promise to themselves. Right. And, um, the suggested we there is a suggested contribution it varies according to the country and the, and the place and whether the teacher has to travel but it's basically there to cover the cost of putting on the initiation seminar all of our acharyas have their own independent means of uh, financial support this is very important because in this way there's no conflict of interest between their need for money and the needs of the students. So they can teach purely out of love, out of dedication, right? That's okay. a great term. That's a, yeah. that's a good answer. Yes, man. yes. Yeah. Uh, you have, you know, you have really gave a clear explanation for students who would like to seek the Kriya Yoga path, the stages, and what uh, opportunities they have to come for the initiation and how to do the initiation and certainly this particular interview has given a very you know, wide view of this Kriya Yoga path, Thirumular Sthirumandaram with Shaita Padantali and also your own journey in this path and how you, you, know, you have your guidance uh, you, know, you give to the students. So uh, I, when I met you last time, the ashram in North India was uh, still being constructed. And uh, did you... Uh, when did did you manage to visit this ashram? It was back in up in Kedarnath or somewhere. Uh, you Madrid. were talking about the, the the border of Pakistan, where you need special permission to visit the ashram. Yeah, yeah. Well, we we um, we visited what five years ago. It must have been around 2017. So we began the construction. Well, we began our began the project by mm. first buying land in Badrinath. Badriya. which is one of the four uh, most important shrines in the Himalayas, where pilgrims go. And it is one of the four shrines which every Hindu should visit in their lifetime. Usually it's the last. And it's actually situated 25 kilometers from the border of Tibet. And it is in uh, 10,000 feet or 3,000 meters, surrounded by mountains, which are more than 7,000 meters or 22,000 feet. And uh, it's the end of a long, difficult road. It's closed six months out of the year because of the, the snow. And um, we were able to find an ideal piece of property and we purchased it in 2008. And from the other brothers who were selling it 2009 and 10. And we began the foundation then. 
and then the government decided it needed a master plan for the, the village of Badrinath. So we, there was some delay for about four years, but finally uh, that delay ended and we were able to finish the construction in 2018. Oh, so right. I visited, I took our students there several times during, the, during that period. And I've been there uh, a couple of times since it was completed. And, um, but because of the pandemic, we had to uh, suspend our pilgrimages. There are two groups going, two acharyas from um, Brazil are taking groups there in this September, if, if, if all goes well. I plan to go uh, again with my wife next year, September of 2023. And uh, it's a beautiful ashram. It has 13 apartments, it has two um, 120 square meter halls and a uh, library bookstore. It's a mile from any road. So you have to walk up a steep hill. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's quite pristine. And it's at the base of Mount Nilakandan, which yes, yes. overlooks the, the valley. And it's a significance because this is where Babaji's guru, Agastya, sent him to do tapas. It's where he attained uh, the state of what we refer to as Saruba Samadhi, the state of mm. complete surrender yeah. uh, to the divine. And um, the Pandavas in the Mahabharata, they went there after the, the, the war of Kurukshetra. So it's a uh, um, place of tremendous sanctity for thousands of years. People, uh, particularly yogis, have gone there because of its isolation and its beauty. Thank you so much. We hope to visit the ashram with ashram your blessing. You. And uh, certainly we would like to observe the energy of that place, which will guide us through this path. You know, so thank you so yeah. much for taking your time to giving this right. interview for us. And right. uh, anything, if you would like to add for the closing of this interview. Yeah, I would like to give you all of Babaji's telephone number. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that will be wonderful. Yes. So, this, whatever you need, his support or his blessing, you can repeat it. You can repeat it, or you can sing it sweetly in any melody with love and devotion. And it is the mantra: Om Kriya Baba Ji Nama Om. Let's Om Kriya Baba Ji Nama Om. Om Kriya Baba Ji Nama Om Kriya Baba Ji Nama Om Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful music. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Thank you.